Hello and welcome to Security in Context. My name is Omar Dahi. I'm the Project Director of Security in Context, and I'm very happy to be joined today by Rose Belinda Cardenas, a member of the Security in Context core team and Associate Professor of Latin American Studies and Cultural Anthropology at Hampshire College. Uh, Rose Belinda recently published an article with Security in Context titled, Columbia Stakes at the Poles, From Pervasive Fear to Vivir Sabroso. The article was published just before the last round of the Colombia elections, which were won by the ticket of Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez. Rose Belinda, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Omar. So happy to be here with you. It's great to have you. And we'll get into some of the issues you raise in your article in a little bit. But uh, just to start off with, can you tell us a little bit about the newly elected president and vice president of Colombia? What political program did they run on and, you know, what's their social base? Who are the voters that brought them to power and around what issues? Okay, sure. Let me go step by step. Um, there's a lot to say about all of these things, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, Gustavo Petro is uh, a, an economist with a long political career. Um, he has been a public administrator. He was formerly mayor of Bogota, the capital of Colombia. Um, he was also a senator. Um, he was also, and it has been very broadly circulated in the media, was a member of the M-19 guerrilla that was demobilized in 1990 in Colombia. Um, he, he's a progressive leader um, with, uh, like I said, with really robust experience in administration. Let me say a little bit also about Francia Marquez. Francia is a, I have a lot to say about her. She's a, a, a dear friend and somebody who whose political journey I have followed closely and accompanied for a long time. She's a fierce social leader. Um, she comes from a small mining uh, community in, in, in the mountain in the mountains in southwestern Colombia, she is an environmental activist and, and also an anti-racist warrior. Um, she won the Goldman Prize for Environmental, the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2018, uh, which is the same uh, prize that um, Cáceres won in, in Honduras the year before. Um, what else can I say about Francia? She has served as the legal representative of her community's uh, community council as the black community that that she grew up in. Uh, she ran for Congress in 2018 with Colombia Humana with Petro as well. Um, she's a lawyer. Um, she, but I think most importantly, her politics are deeply grounded in her lived experience and her lived experience as a black woman. She was a, a young mother um, of two, a young single mother of two, and a person who has really lived through all of the struggles that she stands for. I think together their base is really broad, and this was shown clearly in the elections. Um, they, I think together they bring about and they speak to the interests of the youth, of the working class, of women, of the LGBTQ plus community, of black communities, indigenous communities, the, the, the mobilizations that we saw of people getting together, coming from really far away rural areas to make sure that they cast their ballots last Sunday was really impressive in, in communities that don't have access to highways, to roads, to water, um, and that were really invested in making sure that, that they voted for this ticket. So let me um, say just a little bit about about their platform. There's, there's, it's a very ambitious um, platform. It's a very ambitious political project that they have, and that's part of what I think is so exciting about about their their triumph. Um, but I'll just say a few things. Uh, I just, I'll point to five things that I think are noteworthy um, about about their their political platform. And the first is that despite the the bad press that there has been surrounding their ticket about them being, you know, radical communists who are going to expropriate all property in Colombia. They're, um, they're, they're, theirs is a progressive platform that is invested in economic growth, but, but by paying attention to the kinds of things that Colombia has not been paying attention to in a long time. So it's not growth that is based on extractivism. It's growth that is based on investment by increasing productivity, particularly in the countryside and around the agricultural sectors. 
by putting land back into the hands of small landholders, in particular women, um, and re really stressing women's access to property, to land property, making sure that women have titles, that they have access to credit, that they have other means of being um, productive and providing for themselves. So it's a different model of economic growth. The second thing that I'll say is that they're both environmentalists. They understand very deeply that economic growth and, and, and environmental sustainability go hand in hand. Um, so in, in this sense, it's very similar to the Green New Deal, um, that they are really investing in, for instance, overhauling Colombia's energy system in moving away from, um, from fracking, from offshore exploration, um, petroleum exploration, and moving, and, and moving towards renewable, renewable energy sources, and also protection of biodiversity and ecosystems. Colombia is a very rich um, bio, in biodiversity. I believe it's like the second most biodiverse country in the world. And in particular, for instance, they're investing in water systems and water ecologies. Um, so they understand also profoundly the link between economic growth and environmental sustainability. A third thing I would say is that they um, are very intentional about their emphasis on gender equality. So they're proposing a number of measures that have to do with gender equality. They go from, for instance, um, assuring a 50% of seats and of all public seats that should be occupied by women, but also um, putting in uh, measures that reduce, that recognize, and that compensate caretakers' labor, that is usually women's labor in the household. Um, they're also uh, proposing uh, measures that would put in pl into place early alert systems to prevent gender-based violence, um, not only against women, but against LGBTQ community. Um, so there's a whole range of measures that have to do with gender equality. And I, as I mentioned, for instance, also just a general preferential um, access for women to things like education, credit, um, property, et cetera. Um, a fourth and huge thing that I would say is that they're investing deeply in demilitarizing Colombian society. And after more than 60 years of war, Colombia is a deeply militarized society. I think so much so that it has become naturalized. Um, and their, think they, their, their, their platform includes things like, for instance, uh, moving the um, national police from the Ministry of Defense to the Ministry of of the interior so that they become more like civilian forces rather than forces um, funded by also reducing the, the budget in defense. Um, they're also, there's a project to dismantle the riot police, which has come under a lot of scrutiny from human rights observers, particularly in light of the protests last year and the recurrent abuses of power by the riot police, which is known as El Esmad in Colombia. Um, and also another, another element of their demilitar demilitarization project includes undoing compulsory military service, which is the case in Colombia has been. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of parts to this uh, re the reduction of militarization of social life. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, which has to do with their economic project, is a, a tax reform. Um, they are proposing a tax reform that would shift um, the onus of taxing to major fortunes. So, you know, in order to fund a lot of these social projects, obviously, the, the government has to have revenue and, and they are proposing to shift that the, the revenue come. Petro has mentioned, for instance, um, focusing on the 4,000 largest for fortunes in Colombia and guaranteeing a unified public pension system. Um, and guaranteeing a minimum income for those who have been unable to contribute to the pension system. So there's a whole tax reform that is that is intended to be more equitable. Great, thank you so much. That's that's very useful, and I want to talk a little bit more um, about some aspects of this very ambitious political program, as you say. Although one we would identify as probably social democratic, a progressive social democratic platform. Right. Um, 
that is also desecuritizing given the context in Colombia. And I, and I want to return to that context of, of violence that, that um, um, you've also, you know, uh, written or, or know quite, quite a bit about uh, in, in one moment, but um, uh, you were also there as part of a group monitoring the elections. And I wanted to see if you could just share some of your experiences and how is it like to monitor the elections? What was the sort of you know, atmosphere like in Colombia? What were some of the discussions that were happening? This was during the first round of elections, I believe. You weren't there for the, right. the final runoff, but tell us a little bit about your experience uh, when, when you were there monitoring it. Yeah, so I was there for the first round, which was May 29th, and I was there with a delegation that was organized by an organization called Afro Resistance, which is an organization that is focused um, on human rights across Latin America, but with an emphasis on racial justice and in particular um, with, an, with a, a focus on Black populations across Latin America. I have worked with Afro Resistance for many years now, and this is not the first delegation that I have uh, been with them on. So, I, so it was a very particular kind of experience that was um, Afrocentric. There, it was a delegation of 29 women, uh, majority Black women. I think only a couple of us, maybe two or three of us, were not Black women from the U.S. and other, and also from other parts of Latin America. Um, so it was really focused on diasporic solidarity. This is, is, has a lot to do with the work that Afro Resistance does. Um, we did the observation in two cities of the Southwest, Cali and Buenaventura. Cali is the city with, I think, in absolute terms and absolute numbers, the largest Black population in Colombia. And Buenaventura is the city with the largest percentage of black population in Colombia. So it's a smaller city, but it's 90 plus uh, percent um, Afro-Colombians. So they, this, th I say this because this was a very particular experience. If you look at the geographical distribution of, of the election results, um, this was one of the areas that had very strong support of, of the Petro Marquez ticket. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm going to assert that this has a lot to do with Francia's uh, presence in the election with the incredible, formidable force that she is um, across the Pacific, across the Caribbean, um, in, in some areas that are also indigenous areas. But the, in Colombia, the geographies are very clear in terms of the populations that, that live there in the Pacific and the Caribbean coast are very strongly black um, populations. So um, what was the experience and the atmosphere? Um, you know, we started, we were a delegation, like I said, of 29 women, but we spread into two cities. And I and overall, now I'm forgetting the exact number, but we, we saw, I'm gonna say close to 20 different voting, um, voting posts. We visited many different voting posts because we moved throughout the day through different voting posts, starting from the moment that they opened the polls. And then we stayed through the counting at the last poll that we were at. There were lines of people waiting to vote at the, at the first, as the first post that I was present at, I was in Cali. Um, and like I said, this is a stronghold of the Petro Marquez ticket. And so it was unsurprisingly across the board, um, what we saw in the election results because we were there to also see the counting and to uh, be witnesses for the final forms that were submitted um, that this that, that the, the, the even in the first round that the Petro Marquez uh, ticket was overwhelmingly uh, ahead of everybody else. The other thing that I'll say is that just very briefly, I had the fortune of uh, being close and in the quarters of Francia's campaign, Francia's movement that is called Soy Porque Somos, shortly after the elections, um, and and heard an analysis of a, a firm that did an analysis of the elections to to to, to see if there had been um, uh, fraud a, a, across the country in the first round of the elections, and of course we did see some. Anomalies throughout the day. There were some things that raised our our attention, and there were always cases. You know, some of the things that we were looking out for was, for instance, the access of, um, in particular, trans people 
to vote because their IDs um, oftentimes differ in how they are identified. And so making sure that, that their rights were being um, that were being observed and, and their access to the polls. So there were some instances that we observed of people that had difficulties. Um, but overall, um, I, I think the overall conclusion was that the elections went well. Thank you for that. Um, returning now a little bit to the context uh, in Colombia that, that these sort of elections are responding to. Uh, in the article you wrote for uh, the Security and Context website, you um, mentioned, and I'm quoting here, Colombia is a paradigmatic example of the failures of the current international approach to security that focuses on strengthening state apparatuses of violence. And you go on to describe a little bit more about the, uh, the challenge that uh, Petro Marquez uh, ticket is responding to. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the history of the violence in Colombia, the Colombian security state, uh, we also know that Colombia is um, one of the countries with the greatest wealth inequalities in Latin America, perhaps one of the most in the world, which is, you know, in a region, Latin America, that is known of traditionally having high uh, wealth inequality in the form of land inequality and, and other types of inequalities. Um, tell us a little bit about the backdrop, both about these entrenched inequalities, but also about this long legacy of the civil conflict uh, in the country. Yeah, so, I mean, Colombia is the site of the longest lasting war in the Western Hemisphere, depending on when you start counting the beginning of the war, um, 60 plus years. And I think that one of the key things to, to think about, to keep in mind in terms of, of the armed conflict in Colombia is that although formally the peace accords were signed in 2016, that the violence since has not significantly abated, that there continue to be armed groups um, outside of uh, opposing the state and outside of, um, uh, let's just say, dissident armed groups, um, and that there, could, there continues to be a lot of violence. I mentioned in the article one of the key uh, indicators, I think, that really cast doubt on this idea that that peace has been attained in Colombia after the peace accords. And that indicator is how many um, human rights defenders have been murdered even since the signing of the peace accords. Um, I, I believe the number at this point up until March of this year is around 1,100 since the signing of the peace accords or maybe around 1,200. I don't have the exact figure in my head. Um, but these... But, this has made Colombia the most dangerous place in the world to be a human rights defender or to be a community organizer, or, you know, we, we can call it after the peace accords to be the people who are monitoring the implementation of the peace accords. So those people who have been invested in making sure that the letter of the peace accords as they were written is actually being implemented are those who are most vulnerable. And this includes Francia herself. Um, she has been, um, she has received death threats for many years and has been the target of attacks, including the last one in 2019, an armed attack on her on her life and a group of other activists who were meeting um, in, in southwestern Colombia and they 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 were attacked. Um, so so the I think the it's it's difficult to understand understate the extent of the violence and Another indicator that is important, maybe, and that that illuminates a little bit is is the number of displaced people, internally displaced people in Colombia. Depending also of how you do the accounting, you know these accountings are always difficult. Um, but depending on how you do the accounting, Colombia has the largest accumulated number of internally displaced people in the world, um, and and displacement has also not fully abated since the signing of the peace accords. And, and, and speaking about securitization specifically, I think Colombia has also been the largest recipient of, for instance, U.S. foreign aid that was directed explicitly towards strengthening the armed forces, uh, towards the eradication of the, the dissidents, of, of dissident groups in Colombia. And even after over a decade, Blanc Colombia, which was the name of, of the 
uh, bilateral agreement between the U.S. and Colombia that ended in 2015 and that was greatly sponsored by President Uribe. And, uh, you know, I don't have the exact figures of how much money was funneled into the Colombian armed forces over those years. But it, it was precisely over those years of Plan Colombia's existence where violence was worse in Colombia. So I think that's the that's part of the context that I was referring to, that the data is very clear. The experience is very clear. The more economic resources that have been put into all of the systems of militarization in Colombia have only resulted in more violence, not the opposite. Thank you for that response and for raising the ties to to the U.S. security state. And I think this is sort of leads me to my last question, which is perhaps a bit speculative, um, but also thinking about the regional context. Um, the yeah. you know news coverage of the election repeated. This is the first you know leftist president or leftist ticket in the history of Colombia repeatedly. There was all of this discussion about how Colombia seemed to be immune from regional trends of the so-called mm. pink tide. And of course, there are all these facile generalizations that are made about Latin America, whether of you know the rise of the left or the fall of the left. But I was wondering if you could just comment a little bit about you know the current moment in Latin America in a broader context with um, left-wing governments coming back to power, the possibility of also Lula coming back to power in Brazil. In Chile, we just had uh, a sort of a left the government come to power as well and uh, also have an ambitious uh, program responding to uh, the, the entrenched inequalities and other issues there. So I was wondering if you could comment on the regional um, picture, but also uh, maybe the second part of that is, you know, the, the response by the U.S. or the, the nature of the security ties, whether these you anticipate, as as I think we might, that they might pose significant obstacles to this this government trying to enact meaningful reform on on all these different fronts. Yeah, I I definitely think my response is speculative at this stage, but hopefully, you know, founded on some prior <laughs> experiences in the region before. Um, I think you're absolutely right to characterize that Colombia has been an outlier in every one of the prior waves, the re most recent one being the pink tide of shifting to the left, right? The fact, the very fact that this is the first left-wing government elected in the history of Colombia signals a lot. And also that Colombia has been a key partner in the U.S.'s presence across the region in guaranteeing what they call freedom and security across the region which in many which in many cases has to do with acting against these kinds of governments left wing governments that 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 are pursuing greater equality across the region i don't I, what I have been reading in the media gives me mixed signals, right? On the one hand, you have responses particularly from the u s and then I want to talk about just Latin America just Latin America without thinking about the U.S. so much. But I think the U.S.'s response, you have responses even before the election, right? You have interventions um, by Congress people in the U.S., um, like uh, Maria Elvira Salazar, who's a Republican, uh, by Marco Rubio, who were already raising uh, alarms about the possibility of, of Petro Marquez's victory, um, just recently, earlier this week, Republican Senator Ron DeSantis also made a statement about uh, characterizing Pedro as a um, narco-terrorist communist who was invested in spreading totalitarian left-wing ideology across the region in reference, I think, to, you know, this Re, uh, return of what we might call the pink tide, the return of the pink tide across Latin America and expressing great concern about what that will mean for freedom and security in the region. So you have those responses, which are not surprising at all. Um, I think they were to be expected and they signal some of the challenges ahead. Um, unfortunately, and again, unsurprisingly, some of them come from fellow Latin Americans and Latin American descendants who have vested interests in maintaining inequality in the region. I mean, I think it's as simple as that. Um, on the other hand, um, Secretary of State Blinken had a call with um, with Petro on Monday to congratulate him and at least, you know, formally indicate that the Biden administration is looking forward to working with his government. Um, so we will see, I, I guess, in terms of 
um, U.S. foreign policy, how that relationship moves forward. Uh, I do know that Petro has indicated since before his victory that he intends, for instance, to reestablish um, diplomatic relations with, with Venezuela. And at the same time, he has been critical of the Maduro administration in a way that is, you know, not, not that is balanced, I believe. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot that still needs to unfold um, and that I am not unsure about. I will say this, though. I do think that with this win, uh, along with all of the other ones that you mentioned, including Chile, Bolivia, Honduras, um, well, uh, Mexico, um, I'm currently in Mexico, so um, it's looming large also in my, in, in, in my thinking. But I do think that this shifts the overall um, political landscape with the, with the Brazilian elections also coming up across Latin America. I think, I want to think that the role of the U.S. in Latin America is not what it was throughout the 20th century as the single most inf- biggest superpower influence. But I also want to think that we are capable of thinking of Latin American solidarities outside of those influences. And that this this has a meaning for um, both in Latin American and South-South collaborations that do not entirely depend on the U.S. or the presence of other, other superpowers in the region. Thank you so much, Rose Belinda. That was really that was really wonderful and illuminating. And of course, we need to see how uh, the next months and, and years unfold, uh, what the U.S. response will be. I mean, the um, the failure, I think you can say, of the OAS summit in Los Angeles, mm-hmm. where there was significant no-shows and boycotting and uh, all around diploma- uh, diplomatic failure by the U.S. to, you know, really shows the limits of U.S. power and also that the dynamics of the region are uh, increasingly independent of U.S. dictates uh, with all other actors as well. And all of that are things we can sort of talk about in the future. But for now, I really wanted to thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, if you missed Rose Belinda's article, you can see it on securityincontext.com. It's great to learn a little bit more of the context leading up to the elections. And uh, we'll stay in touch with you as things develop. Thank you. Thank you.